This is episode 231 of the Beyond the Food Show, and today we're going to talk about a very important topic, children body image with Katie Crenshaw. Stay tuned. Welcome to the Going to Beyond the Food Show. I'm Stephanie Dozier, clinical nutritionist and emotional eating expert, creator of the Going to Beyond the Food method and founder of the Going to Beyond the Food Academy. Corporate executive turned health expert with my own journey with weight, body image, and food. It's now my mission to help smart, successful women like you live confidently right now and unconditionally. Ready, sister? Let's do this. Welcome back, sisters. Your guest here is Stephanie. And today is a very important episode in my heart. And I know it's going to be for a lot of you. It's about children's body image. And this episode was triggered by many moms in my life from my real life and also my online life and my clients. 40% of our clients within the Beyond the Food world are actually moms who wants to stop generational dieting and struggle with body image. The trigger, the motivating factor for them to do their work is their children. How do we approach the topic of body image with our children? I'm a strong believer in lived experience, specifically in the field of um, intuitive eating and body image. And I'm not a mom, right? Some of you may not know this, but I am a woman who chose not to have children. So when I talk about these topics, I want to bring real life to it. So our guest today is... Katie Cranshaw, and she's a mom of three, three children below the age of 10. So she's also the author of a book that came across my path. And this is how this podcast got triggered to go live is because of the work. Some of you perhaps have seen my video or my email blog that I've been sending to my community, work that I've been doing with Ashley Durow, uh, where Ashley took her journey of learning intuitive eating and making peace with food public with me. And we've been filming our session and, and Ashley introduced me to Katie and Katie presented me with this book, this amazing book title, Her Body Can. And it's a book that Katie just released and it's all about children's body image in a format visually and both written that is designed for children. This is the kind of book that you can just leave on the coffee table and have your children pick it up without you triggering it, just pick it up and start looking and they can start asking you questions. So this is the tool you can use to initiate the conversation without shocking your kids and forcing them into a place where perhaps they don't want to talk about. But this is a tool. And I have been looking for tools for moms, for my community, for my client. And thus far, I was not able to find such a book. And so to me, this is the first body neutrality book that's going to help you as a mom, a grandma, an aunt, Like if you're a woman of any kind and you influence children, you have to read this book. This is how critically important it is and perhaps have it in your home so you can initiate the conversation with uh, children. Now, a piece of advice uh, for all of you that are moms and want to engage your children into this conversation, one of the things that we know from Um, children's learning and also from neuroscience is the fact that 70% of children's learning, right? Children are born with a brain that needs development. And that's what children do from the age of zero to the time they (laughs) become an adult, right? And perhaps even later than 18. But um, they learn, young children learn 70% from visual cue. They learn from watching us adults. They learn from hearing us talk between ourselves, not directly to them, like when we just talk between ourselves. They learn from what is being said on TV, 
on the podcast you're listening to and the conversation with your girlfriend. That's how most of their learning happens. So if you have a struggle with food and body image and you're trying to hide it from your children by, quote, not talking about it directly to them, they still will pick up on it. So my biggest advice for all of you moms before you go into the discussion with your children is to do your own work, is to learn intuitive eating, is to learn body neutrality, um, work on your mindset, like do your own work so you can be a living example of what it means to be at peace with your body and with food. And that's how I started the podcast by saying that 40% of our clients are actually moms and grandma that actually wants to change how they impact children in their life. That's the most beautiful gift you can give a child is living at peace with food and your own body, no matter what the size is, so they can see what it means to be at peace with diverse body type. So I've linked in the show notes uh, to a couple of resources to help you with that. Uh, we do have a program in which we only talk about body image. I don't speak to this program often because I don't think it's the right starting point for most women, but we do have the Body Acceptance Project. It's a five-week self-study program to teach you the basic to change your own body image. Um, it's self-study, so it's not supported by me or by a group or by anything. It's something that you do on your own. Um, if that's what you need and, and you believe that that's what would make the difference for you, I've linked to it in the show notes, stephaniedoza.com slash 231. Um, however, my recommendation is that you start with learning intuitive eating because that is where most of the impact can be had is when you learn to make peace with food because a byproduct of making peace with food is making peace with your body. So I've linked to those two resources. I can support you into both. Uh, those are both in the show note, show notes, um, and perhaps I'll see you in one of those programs. In the meantime, our I want to just quickly introduce you to our guest today, Katie Crenshaw, in case you don't know her. Uh, she's a mom of three, but she's also a lifestyle blogger and a author. She wrote the book, Her Body Can, as a way to encourage children to create a reality for themselves in which they love themselves and their body for exactly who and what they are, instead of learning to judge themselves and hate their body for what they are not. So if you're ready for this, let's go to the interview. Welcome to the show, Katie. Thank you for having me. I'm very excited about this. Uh, your book came through... Um, a post just started to follow you because of the work that I've been doing with Ashley. And when I saw the book, I'm like, Oh my God, this is what my people want. So I'm very excited to have this with you, this conversation with you. And I'd like to start with how does this book, her body can came to life? Like what's the backstory to that? Yeah. So, um, I was actually speaking with my friend Addie, who's another blogger local to me in Atlanta and, um, Addie and I are both plus size women. Um, so we've had plenty of conversations just about that. And, um, I guess it was about, about nine months ago now, um, Addie was like, why aren't there any books with just like a plus size princess? Um, you know, like just like a main character that's a plus size girl. And I was like, I don't know, because Addie just became a mom. So like nine months ago, she just had a baby. Um, so she was kind of all of a sudden seeing children's books and like noticing that stuff. And I was like, yeah, you're right. Like I'm 10 years in and I don't, none of my kids books have a plus size, you know, protagonist. So, um, she was like, we should write one. Like this is, you've been in this space and like, we could write one. And I was like, yeah, we could. So, um, I was actually already working with an editor on a memoir. And, uh, so I reached out to her and I was like, would you be open to helping us with a children's book? And she was like, sure. So, um, that's kind of how we started. And then the more we started talking about creative direction, um, we kind of, you know, we started talking about the challenges that plus size little girls 
face or like stigmas they face. And that's how we started to come up with the content. And then my movement, her body can just sort of naturally weaved into it. So we, it became a rhyming book and every, every spread starts with her body can. That's amazing. So tell people, because, um, people are perhaps new to your own platform outside of the book, you have your own journey through body positivity and it's public because you have a lifestyle blog. How did you came to talk about this in your own platform? So when I started my blog about five years ago, um, it was, it was always to talk about hard stuff. I never, I came into the space to talk about the, the harder sides of motherhood because I felt like that was lacking five years ago. Um, I feel like authenticity is kind of trending now, which is cool. But um, at that time, I wanted to be like the opposite of a Pinterest mom. And like, I wanted to talk about maternal mental health and how it was hard for me um, to find my place. So um, part of, you know, the challenges of being a mom, what is body image and for all of us. So I started to open up about that. I think the first time I ever did, it was with a, it was like a loop of other bloggers who were talking about their postpartum bodies. Um, and the response was just so huge. It felt like this is really needed. Um, and as someone who advocates vulnerability, um, I was like, this is a, this is a needed topic. So I'm going to keep talking about this. And the more I talked about it, the more people related, the more people sent messages. And it just really felt like a comfortable place to, to be with my content. That's beautiful because uh, I know Ashley, um, he is in the same vein as you, right? It's about yeah. bringing that topic to motherhood as far as body image. But I think with this book, and this is where I'd like to angle the rest of the conversation, is how then do you think that conversation with your children? Because you're a mom of three. Can you mm -hmm. remind the age of your kids for the audience? They're 10, 4, and 2. Okay. So in one, you already are having the conversation, and then you're mm -hmm. beginning with the little guys, I'm assuming, right? Right. So the 10-year-old, I'm, I'm already actually having to have inquisitive conversations that are hard. And then with the other two, I'm, I'm just starting to have to be wary of what I'm displaying in my own behavior. So, so constantly conscious right yeah. now of everybody. And I think that's what makes it even more interesting um, about, because it's two different types of conversation, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think you're taking it from two different perspectives because with the 10 year old, you weren't yet in the body positive movement at the beginning, Correct. So now the conversation may look different than the other one that they're brought up into this new environment. Absolutely. And it was um, with with Grayson, my oldest, he's 10. And when he was my first, you know, the first is always the guinea pig. And um, when he was a baby and, you know, in his formative years, I was very much dealing with like varied forms of eating disorders and orthorexia. So I was like, super hardcore about like no sugar. Like I never let him have juice until he was like five. And like, I mean, I was super restrictive. And at the time I thought that was, I was doing a good thing and I was like 23 and, you know, I thought that was so great, but I can see now signs of like him hoarding candy and like, you know, like, mm. which is, is a bummer, but like, also I'm happy that I have the knowledge now to try to undo it before it's too late. Um, but yeah, I'm really honest with myself about the fact that I didn't handle that well. And so with my other two, my smaller two, we don't do that. We don't restrict anything. Uh, well, you know, <laughs> to an extent, um, we, you know, there's, there's no rules on food in that regard here. So, um, so yeah, it's very, it's very interesting. And it's also interesting with the age difference to see how that type of parenting affected him 10 years later. So that's some of the question. If you don't mind, I'm just going to, like, I'm all over the place when I do yeah, interview. No, like, fine. I go with the flow wherever the guest wants to go. So for people to know, I've posted on Instagram, which is the platform where I, we can have the quickest interaction, question from moms or anyone for Katie today about the book, because I've been intensely talking about her book. Uh, and a lot of questions that came in, not a lot, but I would say about 25% of the question was about food. Mm -hmm. So since we're talking about this, one of the question was tips for four-year-old to self-regulate with food. So I think you can talk about the two experience, right? Where you restricted food with your oldest, and now you have a completely different perspective. So can you mm -hmm. talk about this? 
how you deal with food or sugar particularly. That's the big one. Yeah. I mean, I'm certainly not an expert or a dietitian, so this is just how I've changed things. But, um, for me, uh, well, so Grayson, my oldest, again, he's come home, you know, he's in like health classes now and stuff. So he's come home and like specifically asked about the calories and, you know, hard questions. Um, and I can't have too many calories or my friends said I'll get fat and like, you know, stuff that you can't control. This stuff happens at school. Like, and you have to, you know, he comes home and you have to be like, okay, no, like, let me explain what calories are and like what all this means. And, um, you can see that I have naturally like chipmunk cheeks and so do my kids. So like Grayson will be like, my friends said my cheeks are fat. And I'm like, well, that's my entire life. Like, so, sorry, like you're, it's fine. But, um, but with food, especially now that, um, I've come a little bit further in that journey, um, one thing I had to really undo was culturally examine why I was saying no to things. So like, mm. no, you can't have cake for breakfast, but like a donut is okay for breakfast. Why? You know, like it was like, why am I saying like freaking out and being like, no, you cannot have that. But then I was thinking of other things nutritionally that were like the same, but somehow they're culturally acceptable for breakfast. It made no sense. So that's like a really baby step, but you know, why can't we have dessert before dinner? Why can't we have cake for breakfast? Like, it doesn't make any sense. If well, you really we have it pancake for right, breakfast, right, right? right? Why not a donut? Right. Or like, no, yeah, it doesn't make sense. Um, and then also I've learned from from you and other people on Instagram, like, to offer the sweets, don't make it a thing where they're like, it's like this game where they have to beg for it and make deals for it. Like, you just go ahead and offer it with their dinner. And then it's not this like psychological chase for them. (laughs) Like it just, it's just there and they can have it if they want. And it makes it not so taboo for them or something. What's interesting for what I'm taking away from this beyond the actual technical aspect of it is the self-reflection you had to do for yourself, how Mm -hmm. your children push you to question your own behavior. Absolutely. And I think that's where the biggest gift is in this whole when you have children. And it's funny because I would say about 30% of the women that join my program are new moms. Or the moms that the kids are starting to ask questions. They're like, I don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. I have my own problem with food, right? Mm -hmm. It's so much reparenting yourself. And it's it's a question that you didn't perhaps have the opportunity to ask yourself. Oh, absolutely. You don't realize it until it's uncomfortable work. I mean, we've heard this, we've heard other people in this space say this, but um, it's uncomfortable work. It's not like it's easy. You have to really look back and see what you're doing that's problematic. And then also another big piece of my answer to that question is uh, catching myself from talking about food in a negative way, which is very natural to do. Um, you know, we've always, or not we, but I've always done that my whole life. You know, I've heard adults growing up say like, this is bad. This is good. This is clean. This is, you know, I can't do this. I can do this. So, um, really stopping myself from, you know, addressing food with any moral, um, weight, um, Mm -hmm. was, was a big deal just so they wouldn't overhear that. Because when I thought about how much of my relationship with food was formed just based on what I overheard, not even what anybody told me, just listening to how my parents talked about food and their bodies really was the foundation of how I looked at myself. Can I, I'm going to ask a question because you've got your oldest to which he heard you speak about, right? Mm -hmm. Labeling food. And then you have your little guys who have never heard you. So when your oldest challenges you on your old comments or belief that you had, how do you respond to that? I don't know if he fully remembers, but I know that he has, I mean, you know, verbally, but I know that he has views of food based on how, you know, he may not remember consciously, but sure. those are his views. Um, so we just, I tell him, I mean, thank God for social media in this regard, because I save so many posts and like how to talk to your kids. And, um, and so we just talk about it. I break it all the way down to why calories are important and why nutrition is important and why, I, you know, if I didn't have calories and carbs, I wouldn't have been able to run a marathon. And, um, he's a very, He's 10, but he's very analytical and he likes 
stats and stuff. So I'll tell him about glycogen in your brain and how like we literally can't function without all types of food. And, and he understands that it's really simple. Like it's very simple when you, when you break it down that way. And I think uh, when we'll put resources also in the show note, but do you have one account that really is helping you on social media with food? Yes. It's, um, kids eating Eat color food. is my yes. favorite. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, what is it? Kids eating color. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to put the sh in the show note, the link to that. It's my favorite one as well. Yeah. So can we shift the discussion to body image? Because that's really the centric element why we're here. Uh, one question that came in is, should we focus on body are all beautiful or body neutrality? I'm always torn with this as a mother. I'm in the body neutrality camp. I, um, I've always, I don't know about always. I think I jumped on the body positivity bandwagon pretty hard at first, but mm -hmm. the more feedback I got from women that felt so defeated by that term, yeah. um, and they felt like something was wrong if they weren't reaching this positive mindset. Um, I backed away from it because the more I thought about it, I agreed. And I'm also someone who I believe in, you know, the whole spectrum of emotion and I don't want to be unrealistic. I'm not expecting people to look in the mirror every day and be like, you are so beautiful by the world standards and like screw the haters. So, <laughs> um, so I started kind of challenging people more often to be, you know, come from a neutral place. Um, I don't, you know, I don't love my body every day. I don't think, oh, you're, you're so stunning. Like <laughs> every day, it's just not the way it is. But what I don't do is let my body, my body's appearance, keep me from showing up to life and doing what I want to do and being in photos and all the things. So, um, neutrality feels more attainable to me and to many women. Um, it's just acknowledging that our bodies are good, um, and capable and what it looks like is irrelevant. And I just feel like that's a lot easier to grasp mentally than positivity. It doesn't feel so like, wow, I'm never going to reach that point. And I think in some way it's, it's funny because we have the same philosophy positive, like saying that bodies are beautiful, still attach a notion of self-worth to your mm -hmm. external shell, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? It may not be yep. beautiful to standard, but it has to be beautiful to this new category of standards. And it's very subjective. Yes. And yeah. it's, it still takes us away from the notion that our self-worth is innate and it's in us and we don't have to be beautiful or great or smart. We just are worthy because we are born. As simple as that. How do you teach that to your children? Clearly there's messaging in the book about that, but how does, what does that look like in conversation with your children? That's another thing that takes effort. Um, I definitely grew up with an amazing dad who loved me so much, but he told me I was beautiful all the time. So, you know, what you don't realize is that sort of setting kids up to feel like, well, if I'm not beautiful, what am I? Um, if I feel I'm beautiful, what's left? So, um, as much as I want to tell, I'm tempted, especially with my daughter to be like, you are so pretty and you're so gorgeous. Like I really try to stop myself and, um, keep focus on her, her intrinsic qualities. Like she, you, that is so funny and you're such a good friend and you know, that was so kind. And so I try to really keep the focus on their personalities and, um, and then also, um, just celebrating what I can do. Like, I think I still feel like it's very important to demonstrate a, a mom who lives more than her appearance and even more than a mother. I think it's really important for my kids to see me attempt to run a marathon and attempt to, you know, write a book. And I want them to see that there's so much I can do that doesn't have anything to do with what I look like. Um, and I hope that sticks later. <laughs> Well, I think it, this is a great example because one of the struggle that when mother starts doing this work, there's always a notion that I have to help them with, which is I'm being selfish because I'm working on myself. Mm -hmm. What would you answer to women who are like having this thoughts in their head right now? Okay. So I just read Untamed by Glennon Doyle and there was this paragraph that I highlighted and like, I want to plaster it on my ceiling, um, in regards to 
being a selfish woman. So Glennon said, I burned the memo presenting responsible motherhood as martyrdom. I decided that the call of motherhood is to become a model, not a martyr. I unbecame a mother slowly dying in her children's name and became a responsible mother, one who shows her children how to be fully alive. And I just love that. That like perfectly sums up how I feel about it. Um, It's so much more important that we show our children how to be selfish. (laughs) I mean, selfish, because who else is going to show them how to, to care about who they are on that level? Absolutely. Like children, I've read this in some psychology book, they don't learn from what we say to them. I think it's only 20% of their learning. 80% of some crazy number is actually what we do. Mm -hmm. So girls and boys will learn from their mom not spending any time on themselves. I believe that. Much more than her saying, no, no, you got to self-care and you're going to practice self-care. We have to embody it. Yeah. And self-care isn't isn't always what you think it is. I mean, there's a million different things that could make you feel fully living your identity. For me, it's not necessarily naps and bubble baths. It's, you know, working. I like enjoy working and writing because that is who I am. So just finding, identifying yourself and like figuring out what makes you, you, and then spending time on that is the best gift you can give your children, I think. Someone asked a question about mental health because you are an advocate for mental health, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, So how about a kid's mental health book and how is that being expressed daily in your life, in your own journey versus what you talk about with your kids? So can you give a little bit background for people that are new to you? Like what's your mental health journey? Yeah. So I have struggled with anxiety and anxiety disorder since I was nine years old and uh, depression since I was an adult and then exacerbated at times in postpartum periods. So I've kind of always been on that journey. Um, I have been on medication and in treatment since I was in my early twenties. And, um, I'm very vocal about that, especially as it pertains to the perinatal postpartum period. Um, and I'm a spokesperson for a nonprofit that also works to erase stigma and spread awareness. So, um, that, that is very dear to my heart. Um, and I'm, I'm a little hypervigilant of my own children <laughs> just because, you know, I, I know that there's a good chance one or more of them will struggle as well. Um, and what was the question about the book? <laughs> how, how, do you, how do you engage? Will there be a book on kids' mental health in the future? And how do you engage mental health in your conversation with your children? Um, that's a really great idea for a book. Um, <laughs> that I, can go on your list to do in the future. Right. Yeah, no, that's, that's a brilliant idea. Um, we have a lot of open conversations here, especially with my oldest, who's more of an age of, of those kinds of conversations. He's, I've always vocally told my children, um, you know, like mommy doesn't feel good because, you know, my mind doesn't feel good today or whatever. We've always been, uh, really o- open about that. And I know that it's working because my son has definitely come to me to tell me like, I think I'm having some anxiety or, um, he's come to me and even told me that one of his friends was having suicidal thoughts. Mm. Um, so things that we've talked about, he's initiated conversation with me, which makes me, you know, we all hope our kids come to us with that stuff rather than hide it. So, um, so we're very open about all of that here and it's not a scary thing and we don't stigmatize it. We just talk about it as if, he had a sore throat or <laughs> mommy has a sore throat, <laughs> same type of thing. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm a big believer in keeping all of that open. One of my favorite things is talking about, you know, depression and even suicide with your children won't make them depressed or commit suicide any more than talking to them about llamas will make them a llama. So, um, keep the conversation open for sure. And it's, again, your own self-work that you have to do. Like you first, to be able to have those normalized conversation, you need to be comfortable with the topic yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Right? And I think for me, when when I looked at the book and I read it, the one word that came out of the book is normalization. Like we're normalizing body, we're normalizing self worth we're normalizing food, all to bring that neutrality aspect to that relationship to the body, but we also need to neutralize everything else. 
Yes, absolutely. And I think showing up without apologies is the bigger work I've posted before about, hey guys, hey fellow plus size bloggers, like we don't have to make a post and and with a whole dramatic caption about why we're allowed to show up. We just need to show up. Like we just need to post and make it normal to see us in your feed. And I feel the same way about mental health and about children's body image. Um, that's why we wanted a book that didn't center around bullying or yes. uh, a sad story first. We just wanted her to be living her best life the whole time from the beginning. <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it's a, it's important to bring up the conversation of drama, but that's perhaps not the greatest stance for teaching. Always. Exactly. Yeah, I, just, I just feel like a lot of the work is just appearing and just being here. So one question that came in three times. His body can book. Yes. Is that in it's, the work? Yeah, we're almost finished with it. Um, actually, we are about to start illustrations. That one deals a little more with gender roles okay. and um, smashing societal you know, ideas of how boys should be. Um, and with all of these books, we consult other people and crowdsource and, and try to get a real feel for what people are dealing with. Um, and then after that, we're actually going to do their body can for non-binary kids. So we're excited. That's amazing. Okay, so how do you teach body image to a boy versus a girl? Is there a difference? Well, we've talked to boys and men to understand how they felt growing up and how um, how they still feel and how they feel limited. Um, so it'll be similar to the girls' book in the way of we're just proclaiming things that they can do if they want to. <laughs> um, I know in talking to my husband and, you know, my son and things like that, they feel like they're expected to be louder or tougher or bigger. Um, so it's a lot of that kind of stuff. It's a different topic in a way because the expectations are different. Absolutely. I know your son is the oldest and then your daughter is the youngest. How my, old is daughter's she? In the, my daughter's in the middle. She's in the middle. She's so four. She's, yeah, she'll, she'll be five this year. And then um, my youngest is a boy too. So let's talk to that younger child. How do you, how do you begin to have a conversation? Like what is your end to the conversation with your daughter, for an example? Well, again, with her age, it's just a lot more of me being really careful about what I'm saying and purposely saying things out loud that I don't, I don't ever comment on anyone's appearance in front of her. Well, really ever. Cause it's just my habit now, but I, um, I don't say a single word about what anybody's wearing or what they look like, or <laughs> I try to have, because I just remember as a child, like overhearing, well, why does my mom think that person shouldn't wear those jeans? Or like, why does my mom think that person's hair is bad? You know, like it was a lot of just overhearing things. So I'm just with her age, I'm just extremely conscious about what I'm saying out loud. So I try not to talk about people's appearance at all because it should be irrelevant. I think it's a very interesting perspective. And again, because I'm not a mom, I can't, I don't have the live experience, but instead of triggering the conversation is perhaps to not trigger the conversation and wait for them to come with the question. I think it's, it's easier that way because then when it comes up and they have questions, um, they want, they'll, they'll naturally want to know why is this person at school telling me this, but yes. like my parents don't do that. And then it's just kind of easier. My daughter has a large facial birthmark. Um, and that has been the center of a lot of my content for years because, uh, we have always tried to normalize that and kind of denounce people who pity it as like a flaw. And so you know, I waited on the day that she would start school and like kids would make fun of her. And I was like, so traumatized, like <laughs> it's going to be so bad. And like, and it wasn't, um, she's in public pre-K she's in school all day, every day. And I've even asked her gently, like, has anybody said anything about your birthmark? And she's like, no, um, if you don't make it a big deal, they won't. So that's just, it's pretty easy <laughs> right now with her. So because some of the questions were like one of the mom asked, like, my son is on the low spectrum of the growth chart. So how mm -hmm. do I engage with him? Perhaps is not to engage with it and wait for the question to come in. Or would you have a different advice? 
my advice would be to not go there until they come to you. Um, sometimes our adult minds have, we forget that we have so many more decades of experience in trauma and we project it and, um, we're just waiting on something bad to happen and it might not. So I would say to not bring it up until they do. How did you engage with your daughter's birthmark? Because it's no different than being in a plus size body. It's just like an aesthetic appearance yeah. base. How did you engage with that? Um, honestly, I, d I did the hard work of not bringing it up and until I needed to. And I really still haven't needed to. <laughs> like I've, I asked because she, she started school and I just wanted to make sure she wasn't like hiding anything. But I just said like, oh, does anybody think your birthmark's cool? Or I said it something like that. And she's like, yeah, no. Like, she's just oblivious. Um, and I'm not saying that that lasts forever. Obviously, developmentally, they come into a place where they start to recognize things. And they might have questions or they yeah. might be concerned. And we'll tackle it then. Um, but, you know, I, I've always said to her and to other people who've asked, like, you know, she has part of her face is another color part of this person's hair is another color. Uh, you know, everybody has something. And the more we act like it's scary or weird, the more we just keep that stigma going. So we're just going to move on and talk about something else. <laughs> it's interesting because I was bullied in junior K, like what I think in the States is like uh, the pre-high school stages anyway, 12 to 14 years old. And mm -hmm. I think part of it for me, I was bullied because I was so uncomfortable in my own body. Mm-hmm. I think if I would have been neutral, I'm not sure I would have had the experience of bullying as much. It's definitely, I was bullied really bad also. And I remember feeling like I was definitely a magnet for, for bullies because I didn't have a foundation. So it felt like when someone yes. picked on me, nobody had ever talked to me about it at home. And I was like, what do I do now? Like, is this bad? Should I not look like this? Should I, you know, all those same things. And there was shame layered around it that to which I didn't reach out to adults to get help. I kept it oh, all yeah. to myself because it was shameful to be bullied. Same here. Exactly same. I would cry myself to sleep and never told my parents. So I think it's very interesting with this approach on how it's thought and how the conversation went that perhaps the bullying won't be as present just because of the, the way we're approaching the conversation. Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I think it's important also to be, to stay human. And, um, I'm open with my son, like, oh, this happened to me when I was a kid and, you know, I've made mistakes and, and this, you know, it's the more human you can stay while still being a parent, the more they'll come to you when they have problems. Two questions to end the conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm holding the book in my hand right now. So if you're a parent that brings this book in the house, how, what would you do with it? with the kids. Oh man, I've seen all these videos now yes. reading it and it's just like amazing. Um, I love watching these moms unbox it and give it to their kids and let them go lead the conversation. It has been so interesting to me to watch these kids lead the conversation. Yeah. Just sit and read with them if they can't read by their own and see what happens. Yeah. And just, or just let them look at the pictures first and see what they notice. It's like, you know, it's, it's interesting having gone through months of work on this book and like really caring about every single detail and going back and forth with the illustrator. And, um, you know, we really cared so much about representation and to see kids open the book and immediately be like, Oh, this kid has a, um, a prosthesis, not, you know, a kid wouldn't say prosthesis, but like this kid has this, like, what does that mean? And like, look at this kid, what flag is that on their shirt? You know, like just seeing what we work so hard on come to life and like be noticed in the way we hoped it would is just like humbling. Awesome. So your parting message to moms out there around body image and food and all that stuff, what would it be? Definitely start from a place of neutrality. Um, I, people ask me all the time, how are you so confident? And I say, I'm not different than you. <laughs> I'm, I have more practice than you. Um, practice, you know, forcing yourself to do things makes it easier no matter what it is. So putting on a bathing suit and showing up at the pool, even though it's like super hard, the more times you do it, the less hard it gets. Um, you can train yourself to, um, to not lose out on things in your life. So coming from a place of neutrality and just continuing to show up in your life, no matter what you look like, 
is the best place I know or is the best way I know how to do it. And then my second biggest advice is to fill your social media feeds with people that represent you, um, with professionals like Stephanie and kids eating color and like all these people that are out there providing free content to help you reparent yourself and address traumas that you've grown up with so that you can, um, raise better humans. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you. I know you're a huge source of inspiration to my community. So thank you for the work you you do. And thank you for being you. Thank you so much for having me. It was so fun. There you have it, ladies. I hope you learned a lot. I know I did because I I don't have children. So I don't know how to initiate those conversations as effectively as a mom. So um, our guest was amazing in sharing her experience. What I'd like to do now is to give you three self-discovery questions around your own history and journey around body image. So you can start discovering how you came to have the body image that you have and perhaps give you a perspective on how you're impacting children around you. So here we go. Question number one, how was your mother's or caregiver's relationship to her body and weight? How would you describe it? Journaling question number two, did my mother or caregiver attempt to lose or modify body weight via diet program or exercise? If so, when did I first notice it as a child and how did it make me feel? And the last question, did my mother or caregiver commented on my body appearance or weight? If so, how did it make me feel? Did I take any measure to avoid her comment? If so, what? I think this self-discovery journey towards your own creation of your body image will help you see how you can change the influence that you have on other children, which by the way, those three questions are taking out of our going beyond the food Academy uh, program. These are journaling questions that we include at the end of each lesson. And this is actually lesson three, which is our story with um, diets and body image. So I hope that can help you. Here's what I want you to do, sister, is to share this episode. As I say all the time, this is a grassroots movement. We're going counterculture against society's norm by not promoting weight loss or food restriction on the Going Beyond the Food show. So we need to share. So share this episode to other moms in your life, grandmas, aunts that needs to hear this message and that needs support in this area. And perhaps I'll be the trigger for them to purchase the book to help have this conversation with children in their life. Thank you so much. I love you and I look forward to hang out with you on the next episode.